Hi, I'm John Riley, and this is the Calculus of Economics. If you're watching this video, you've already completed a course in College Calculus, and perhaps two courses. So you know that calculus is the study of how things change. More precisely, as some input changes, how does the output change? The relationship between an input x and an output y is called a function, and this relationship is typically written as y equals f of x or y equals g of x for some general function, or possibly with a specific functional form y equals 10 plus 2x minus x squared, something like that. So you may well be wondering, if you've taken the college calculus already, why do you need to study more calculus before getting on with what you're really interested in doing, which is doing some economics? Well, there's a sense in which you already have the skills that you'll need for economics, at least the calculus skills. Uh, let me explain. In the diagram opposite, the white region represents the material covered in one course of college calculus. Now, the shaded region is meant to represent the additional material covered in a second course. In economics, a crucial, uh, the, the most important part of calculus is the calculus of maximization. And as you know from your first course, the way you analyze this is to compute the rate at which output changes with an input. This rate is called the derivative, that is, it is derived from the original function, is written as f prime of x. So, as I said, for the study of economics, the most important calculus topic is the calculus of maximization. So, in this diagram, it's the green region. So, if you're going to be able to do economics easily and uh, with confidence, uh, having a very sound understanding of maximization is critical. A college-level introduction to calculus is almost exclusively the study of how an output y changes as a single input x changes. The theory of maximization is then the study of how to find the value of x that maximizes the value of y. In economics, however, there are typically many inputs. Mathematically, x, the input, is not a number, but an array of numbers. It might be n, n such numbers, if you like, think of two numbers, x1 and x2 and mathematicians call such an array a vector. For example, the vector x might be a list of the amounts of different inputs used in the production of the output y. If you're making uh, fancy ice cream in an ice cream parlor, the inputs are the, uh, the cream, uh, the sugar, and all sorts of other inputs. So that's an economic problem, trying to understand what inputs to use to produce the output. As to study economics, it's necessary to understand maximization when the goal is to choose the best array of inputs rather than a sing single input. So you know this part, but there's more to be learned about this. The goal of this online course is to provide you with the tools to be able to work with maximization problems when there are more than one variable to be maximized. And as I've emphasized, the essential building block is the theory of maximization with one input. So as long as you've mastered that, you're ready. Let's look at a few examples. The first one is the choice of a prospect maximizing firm. The firm is uh, producing a single product. So if the firm sets a relatively low price P0, it can sell a lot. Demand is, is high, the demand is Q0, then the price is P0. If it raises the price to P1, it's not going to sell so much, uh, and so let the amount be Q1. So there's a, as P rises, the price rises, demand for the product falls. This is known as the firm's demand function. We're going to consider a simple case. So the quantity demanded depends on a, there's an, a, a term here, a, a constant term, minus half P. Equivalently, we can think of uh, firm in the following way. It asks itself, well, if I wanted to sell just Q1 units, what price could I get, get? Because some people are willing to pay quite a lot for the product, I could get P1 and sell all the units. If I wanted to sell more units, I'd have to drop the price to P0. 
So now we want the relationship between Q, the amount you want to sell, and the price. And we can get that, this inverse relationship. How do we do it? Well, the demand function is 40 and a half minus a half P, double, it's very simple for any linear problem, 2Q equals 81 minus P, rearrange P as a function of Q, it's 81 minus 2Q. This is called the demand price function. From a mathematical perspective, it doesn't matter whether we use the price as the input or the quantity. However, we'll argue later that it is much more helpful from an economics perspective if we use quantity as the input. Let's talk about revenue. Revenue is a function of the output. It's the quantity times the price. The price is 81 minus 2Q, so uh, there is the revenue. We haven't mentioned cost yet, we'll assume that each unit costs 20 to make, then the cost of Q units is simply 20Q. The profit function, that's the thing we're interested in because we want to maximize it, is revenue minus cost, so it's here's the revenue term from here, here's the cost term, subtracting one from the other, uh, it's 61Q minus Q squared. So the question is what quantity should the firm choose in order to maximize the profit of the firm? And you know from your calculus class how to do this. Example two, not quite so uh, obvious. A firm produces two commodities. So we'll write this as an array, a vector of outputs, Q1 and Q2. And we will often use this notation. So if you just see a Q without a subscript, you don't really know whether it's a single output or an array of outputs. Uh, that the context should make that clear. The cost function, the cost depends upon Q, the array, the vector, and has linear terms and quadratic terms. Let's take the simple case of linear demand price functions, and then revenue is just P1Q1, 85 minus a quarter Q1 times Q1, and P2Q2, there it is. Profit is just revenue minus cost, and we don't need to check all, let's check a few terms. The revenue is 85Q1 here. We've got a cost, a linear cost of 10Q1, so there's the 75Q1. We've got a cost of 3Q1, Q2. That's the only place this cross multiplied term appears. So there's a minus 3Q1, Q2. We've got a uh, revenue is minus a quarter to, to squared here, and the cost uh, is 2Q2 squared, so adding those together. We've got this term. So this looks as though it's probably right, and it is. So what quantity should the firm choose in order to maximize the profit of the firm? For, for our third example, we're going to consider maximization with a resource constraint. These kinds of constraints are very common in economics. In our example, a firm uses two inputs in the production of a commodity. If the vector of input quantities is z, Z, which is an array Z1, Z2, then the quantity that the firm can produce is a function of this input array, and here is the function. Uh, the price per unit of input 1 is 8, the price per unit of input 2 is 64. How much output can the production manager produce if she has a budget of $1,200 and then $2,400 to spend on the two inputs? Well, the manager's choices are constrained by the limit on her financial resources. If she had purchased as the input vector Z, the total cost of production, her expenditure, is P1, Z1 plus Z, P2, Z2. This cannot exceed the budget. In mathematical terms, expenditure is less than equal to the budget. So in case 1, 8Z1 plus 64Z2 is less than equal to 1,200. The manager thus seeks to solve the following problem. Maximize output subject to the constraint, subject to this constraint. Actually, there's a second constraint here. It's not just that the budget must be, set budget constraint must be satisfied. But the only numbers that make sense in an economic problem are typically non-negative numbers. So there really is a second non-negativity constraint to worry about. This problem can, in fact, be solved using one variable calculus, but it does require some cunning. Can you figure out how to solve it? Uh, if a method doesn't spring to mind, don't fret. In this course, you'll learn the simplest and most intuitive solution method. 
before beginning the course, I encourage you to watch the Excel video showing how such problems can be solved computationally.